know one another. It was to encourage students, especially from underrepresented backgrounds in neuroscience, to have a, a great leadership filled career. And that is what their legacy has done over the last 30 years. Uh, they, are, um, they were visionaries and they established this lectureship to make sure that this legacy continues. And so each year we invite amazing people like uh, Dr. Julia Ramirez this, this year. Uh, I wanted to say that their course that they established at the MBL in 1989 was its first year. And it has this year broken over 200 applicants and students and uh, now alumni, and most of whom have stayed in the neurosciences and are continuing to do research. Uh, we wanted to thank, to sincerely thank Dr. Martinez and Dr. Townsell who passed away last year and I, I want to uh, just raise to you the, the proposition that they were incredible human beings whose legacy will live on forever. Thank you very much. And I will introduce Dr. Jerry Downs. So actually introducing today's speaker is one of our current SPINE students. Uh, about to be fourth year graduate student in the biology PhD program at Boston University, Juan Martinez Fuentes. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's Martinez Townsell Lecturer, Dr. Julio Ramirez. Dr. Julio Ramirez obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Fairfield University and his, sorry, Bachelor of Science degree, yes, psychology and, and from Fairfield University and his PhD in psychology from Clark University. He taught at the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University. He then went on and did postdoctoral work in neuroscience at MIT. Presently, he is the R. Stewart Dixon Professor and Director of the Neuroscience Program at Davidson College, where he has been since 1986. Dr. Ramirez's research interests include the recovery of function after central nervous system injury, with an emphasis in determining the functional significance of hippocampal neuroplasticity. His research has been supported by the NSF, the National Institute of Mental Health, and the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Dr. Ramirez teaches undergraduate courses in neuroscience and psychology. He has mentored over 200 undergraduate students in his lab, and over the course of his career has been awarded many honors. Uh, to name just a few, in 2011, he received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring from President Barack Obama in recognition of his national leadership um, in mentoring undergraduate students and junior faculty from underrepresented groups in the sciences. In 2015, he was awarded the Bernice Grafstein Award for Outstanding Accomplishments in Mentoring from the Society for Neuroscience. At the Society for Neuroscience, Dr. Ramirez is co-director for the Neuroscience Scholars Program and former counselor and presently, presently serves as treasurer-elect for the society. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Julio Ramirez. Thank you for the really warm welcome. I'm so honored to be here. Three dimensions of people. Oh my God, big round of applause. Now for the viewing audience at home, and I, I suspect at least one or two of you, um, 
Thank you for attending today's session. I also know that you live in three dimensions, but it's really nice to see people in 3D. Before beginning, I'd like to thank Drs. Gina Poe and Jerry Downs for inviting me to participate in this week's session of Spines. I am so deeply honored and moved actually uh, to be able to be here as we honor Drs. Joe Martinez and Jim Townsell. We honor these men because of the extraordinary contributions they made to diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice. And they were doing this before the acronym DEI was invented, well before. I had the privilege of working with both Jim and Joe on MetPAC at the Society for Neuroscience. And I got to know them well as a consequence of the amazing work that they were doing for the community. They inspired me as they inspire all of you. Their eloquence, their dedication to social justice was profoundly moving. And I'm so grateful to be here to honor their memories. What I hope to do in today's lecture is to give you a glimpse of the work that my students and I have been doing at Davidson College over the last 35 years, as well as a glimpse of the once of the path that I personally have traveled in order to get here. Uh, Gina and Jerry asked me to spend a little time talking about how I got to this stage. So if you will bear with me a little later in the talk, I'll spend some time on that topic. After conducting about 10 years of research, into degeneration and regeneration of the nervous system of adult mammalian animals. Ramon y Cajal came to the following conclusion. In adult centers, the nerve paths are something fixed, ended, immutable. Everything may die. Nothing may be regenerated. Uh, that is really bleak. And Ramon y Cajal understood just how bleak that conclusion was. So how do we make sense of it? We now know that this is one of those rare instances in Ramon y Cajal's illustrious career when he was made, mistaken. Over the last 50 years, neuroscientists have demonstrated that the brain and spinal cord are, in fact, highly malleable parts of the central nervous system. What my students and I have been doing over the last 35 years at Davidson is trying to harness the intrinsic capacity of the nervous system's ability to reorganize itself in response to injury, with our goal being promoting recovery of function after central nervous system injury. In 1881, Herman Monk proposed the vicariation hypothesis. He proposed that tissues surrounding damaged cortical areas take over the functions of the damaged regions. And there are three ways in which this might occur. The first is that function may be removed to similar tissue on the contralateral portion of the brain. So for example, if the right frontal lobe is injured, perhaps the left frontal lobe takes over those functions. Second, function may be removed to other uninjured areas on the ipsilateral cortex on the same side of the brain. So perhaps if the right frontal lobe is injured, the right parietal lobe takes over those functions. Third possibility is a function may be removed to some other level of anatomical organization. So if it's a cortical injury, maybe it's a thalamic reorganization, a brainstem reorganization that may be taking place. 
Patrick Wall in 1975 had the following to say about things like vicariation. The usual process of submerging ignorance by nomenclature has been used as though to name is to explain. Shock, diaschesis, and such words, vicariation, have no meaning or usefulness in pointing to an explanation. This is a legitimate problem. What terms like vicariation basically do is say recovery function is occurring. But what it doesn't do, what it fails to do, is to provide us mechanisms by which that might occur. Fast forward 21 years. LF1 walks into a Wash U hospital. LF1 is a right-handed 72-year-old male professional who suffered from a stroke to the left inferior prefrontal cortex. And when LF1 was submitted to neuropsychological testing, he did suffer from a mild to moderate aphasia. with the exception of an island of preserved function. That's a quote from Buckner. An island of preserved function. When LF1 was taking the word stem completion task, it was perfectly normal. What's the word stem completion task? It involves providing the first three letters of a word to the patient or subject. And then the patient is supposed to generate words on the basis of those first three letters. So for example, it's C-O-U. Let's play a game. We're all masked in here, so this is good. And at home, you may not need it. Let's play a game. I'm gonna provide you with three letters. And I want you to vocally blurt out Words that begin with those first three letters. Are you ready? Okay. C O U. Okay, more? All right, there we go. Now we're, I get that brain going. All right, good to hear. Yes, indeed. Um, I heard some that I could recognize behind muffled faces. Count couple, heard a couple of those in there. Coupon was a new one. I've never heard that before. That was a good one. Um, if we had submitted you to a PET scan while you were generating those words in your right-hander, it's likely that what we would see, I'm not sure if my arrow works. You see an arrow up there? Okay, good. What we would see is what Buckner reported seeing with normal subjects, right-handers. While they were undertake, undertaking or undergoing the word stem completion task, the left prefrontal region, supplementary motor areas, and anterior cingulate lit up. They became activated as seen in this PET scan. So the left hemisphere is visibly at work when this word stem completion task is being executed. Buckner and his colleagues heard of LF1, and they were able to study LF1 while he was undertaking the word stem completion task and being submitted to a PET scan. This is one month after the stroke. And what Buckner and colleagues found was the mirror image of what is found in your typical right-hander taking the word stem completion task. The right inferior prefrontal cortex lit up the right supplementary motor area and anterior and single lit up. This is within one month after the stroke. Truth be told, we don't know the pre-morbid status of LF1's brain. But what this does is raise the provocative possibility that within one month after the stroke, LF1's brain had reorganized such that the right hemisphere took over the functions of the left hemisphere. The question I'd like to ask is, are there neural mechanisms that might underlie vicariation? And how do we know them 
when we see them. So there are two criteria that we could use to determine whether or not some neuronal phenomenon might be significant. The first criterion is that the time course of the neuronal phenomenon, whatever it might be, must parallel the post-lesion behavioral change. Second is that manipulating this neuronal phenomenon, whatever it might be, must produce a concomitant or parallel change in behavior. As you're going to see, the experiments that I'll be describing today rely on these criteria. There are multiple levels of analysis that one might explore as we try to figure out what this neuronal phenomenon might be. They may operate at the neuroanatomical level of analysis, the neurophysiological level of analysis, biochemical, and molecular. Neuroanatomically, perhaps what we're looking at is a system in which the connectivity has been altered as a consequence of the lesion and the reorganization. Neurophysiologically, we may see changes in synaptic efficacy, how well one brain area is able to communicate with another. Biochemically, perhaps we're looking at the neurotransmitters that are synthesized with receptors that are inserted into the postsynaptic membrane. And changes at the molecular level, genomic expression may alter and in fact bubble up through biochemical, neurophysiological, and neuroanatomical levels of analysis. An example of neuroanatomical plasticity is axonal sprouting. If three neurons share some common terminal field and one of them is injured, the remaining neurons sprout. They grow new connections, possibly re the vacated synaptic space. So there's a sprouting response. They grow new connections. We now know that lesion-induced sprouting occurs in a wide range of CNS areas, cortex, the brainstem, the spinal cord. We also now know that lesion-induced axonal sprouting occurs in a wide range of adult mammalian species, and this includes human beings. In my laboratory, my students and I have been very interested in the hippocampus. So we use the hippocampus as our model preparation. And we do so for a number of reasons. First, it's a very highly ordered laminar system. It has been well characterized neuroanatomically, neurophysiologically, behaviorally. Lesion-induced alterations in connectivity are readily discernible because of this laminar organization and quantifiable. And finally, functional correlates of lesion-induced structural alterations are readily identifiable and studied. For those of you who haven't looked at the hippocampus recently, let's quickly touch on its anatomy. This is a coronal section of the rostral uh, hippocampus. And the hippocampus is actually uh, two interlocking structures. There's hippocampus proper and the dentate gyrus. We're gonna focus our attention on the dentate gyrus. The dentate gyrus is a three-layered structure consisting of a molecular layer, a granule cell layer, fusiform layer. There is both, oops, I'm sorry. There is both a dorsal view as well as a ventral view in this particular region of the area. The molecular layer is made up of the dendrites that ramify up from the granule cell. The granule cell is the main projection neuron of the DG or the dentate gyrus. This is a horizontal view in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, schematic of the hippocampus. And I'm pointing this out because hippocampus sits directly in front of, at this level, the anorinal cortex. And I wanted to give you an idea of what they are in comparison to each other, because we're going to be looking at the anorinal area in a few minutes. Starting in the early 1970s, Gary Lynch, Carl Kottman, their students and colleagues at the University of California at Irvine made a wonderful set of discoveries. They discovered that there is, in fact, after an anorinal cortex lesion, a dramatic reorganization of circuitry in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. 
And there are a number, but we're going to focus our attention on three of these reactive projections. They include the septodente pathway, the commissural and associational fiber plexus, and the cross temper dente pathway. Here's a schematic to give you an idea of the relationships among them. On the left side, we have normal granule cell. The outer two thirds of the molecular layer um, is innervated by the enteral cortex ipsilaterally. About 90% of the synapses are of enterinal origin. These are glutamatergic, asymmetric synapses that are formed. But there is also in the normal system, a small cross enterinal projection, also called a cross temperdente projection. That's the language I'll be using a little bit later. And then there is a septodente pathway, which is cholinergic and ACHE rich. And it projects the outer two thirds and other places, actually, you'll see some slides in a minute. And then there's a commissural and associational fiber plexus, which innervates the intermolecular layer. That's an intrinsic hippocampal projection, glutamatergic. On the right side of the slide, we see what happens after an enteral cortex lesion. So here we have a, a situation in which the unilater there's a unilateral lesion of the enteral area. We've denervated the outer two thirds of the molecular layer. And we have a sprouting response by the cross enteral projection, by the septodente pathway, and the commissural and associational fiber plexus. That cross enteral projection within about 60 days after the lesion will grow five, 600%. The septodente pathway, which is cholinergic and ACHE rich, within a couple of months will also double in size. The commissural and associational fiber plexus, glutamatergic, intrinsic to the hippocampus, grows out about 30%. These processes are initiated somewhere in the five to seven to 10 to 12 day range. They're going on pretty actively during about that period of time. So I wanted to show you some sections illustrating some of these relationships. This is a horizontal uh, section from a rat that sustained a unilateral lesion of the enteral cortex in the left hemisphere. And 10 days later, the animal was euthanized and the tissue was processed for ACHE uh, using a naked histochemical technique. What we see on the right side is the dentate jars in horizontal plane. This light band here is a granule cell layer. Other band is the supergranular zone, which originates in the septodente pathway as well. Then you'll see kind of this light pale staining zone. That light pale staining zone is the, associated with commissural and associational fiber plexus. And just lateral to it, this moderately stained region is the outer two thirds of the molecular layer, and that's a septodentate origin. ACHE rich, cholinergic. On the left side of this slide, we see the side ipsilateral to the unilateral enterinal lesion. What you'll note from the outset is that the molecular layer is much more deeply stained. You also know, and that's direct evidence of sprouting response by the septodentate pathway. You'll also know indirectly, but it makes for a nice picture, this pale staining zone. The pale staining zone has widened. That's the area that corresponds to the CA, the commissural association of fiber plexus. Now, there's a ton of data out there over the last 35 years that have demonstrated in multiple techniques converging on the evidence that in fact, the CA fiber plexus is sprouting and they're sprouting by the septodentate pathway. This is an illustration of the cross temperdente projection. This is from Ozzy Stewart's work. What Stewart did was to inject tritiated proline into the enteral cortex of a rat. This is horizontal section. And then he did a track tracing study of the ipsilateral projection to the hippocampus, the dente charis, and then the cross pathway to the dente charis of the contralateral hemisphere. This upper right hand corner here is a dark field autoradiogram. What we see is a dense label of pattern, a dense pattern of label found in the molecular layer ipsilateral to the injection, makes sense. And when we look contralaterally, see there is a much lighter pattern of label, but in the molecular layer of the dente charis, contralateral to the injection. This is the normal rat. 
The lower panel is an animal that sustained a unilateral lesion of the entorhinal area in an adult animal. 60 days later, Stewart did a track tracing study of the ipsy and cross pathways. And what you see is the ipsilateral pathway, again, it's a dense pattern of label, to the dentate gyrus molecular layer. But of course, what is so interesting about this particular autoradiogram is that the molecular layer of the dentate gyrus contralateral to the injection is now densely labeled, comparing this top dark field autoradiogram to this lower one. Densely labeled. This is taken as evidence for sprouting by the cross tempered dentate pathway. Everything is fixed, ended, immutable. Well, this is certainly evidence to the contrary. There, in fact, is tremendous reorganization in response to an injury in an adult mammalian brain. So the objective, overall objective of the work that my students and I have been involved with and what many of my colleagues have been doing is to determine whether sprouting in the hippocampal formation of rats is functionally significant. The working hypothesis in my laboratory is as follows. If sprouting contributes to recovery of function, accelerating the rate at which hippocampal sprouting occurs should accelerate the rate of behavioral recovery. This, of course, echoes the earlier criteria we were talking about and helping us determine whether or not we're looking at something that may be functionally significant and relevant. In our studies, we focused our attention on the cross dentate pathway. And we do so for three reasons. First, it emerges from the same cell layer as a normal perforant path infant to the dentate gyrus. These are layer two stellate cells. Second, after sprouting, the cross pathway exhibits many of the same neurophysiological characteristics of the normal perforant path. And this includes paired pulse facilitation and long-term potentiation. And third, there have been previous studies that have demonstrated that sprouting of the CTD may be behaviorally significant. The experiments I'm going to describe today, we've focused our attention on three levels of analysis, the neuroanatomical, the neurophysiological, and the behavioral. And what we used was a progressive lesion paradigm. This is a technique that Steve Sheff actually had created back in the late 1970s. The technique involves making a priming lesion, a very small lesion of the entorhinal area in our experiments unilaterally. And then you wait an interlesion interval or interoperation interval of some period of time. In Sheff's laboratory, he was using between four and 10 days. And then after that window, he would make a secondary lesion of the entorhinal area in that same hemisphere that the first priming lesion was made. And then he had a variety of survival points, and he was able to demonstrate that with this progressive lesion technique, there was an acceleration of septodentate sprouting. I've already shown you some evidence for septodentate sprouting a little bit earlier. We're using this technique in the studies that I'll be talking about next. So I want to focus on what will turn out to be an important control condition in our experiments. The priming lesion in and of itself can elicit a sprouting response potentially. So in our experiments, what we've done is to make a priming lesion, wait the ILI, and in our experiments, we, we only use one six days post lesion. So six days, and then the next day, we made another sham operation. We did not go in and injure the remainder of the entorhinal cortex. And then we rated, as you'll see in some of our experiments, four, six, and eight days post secondary operation. Because what we needed to determine was whether the priming lesion, in and of itself, was able to evoke a sprouting response. So we needed to be able to disentangle the two. So the objective of our neuroanatomical study was to determine whether CTD terminal proliferation is accelerated after these progressive two-stage lesions of the entorhinal area. Basically looking at the same kind of problem that Steve Sheff was looking at, where he was, whereas he was looking at the subdedente pathway, we were very interested in the cross subdedente projection. So what we did was to use a technique that's quite similar to what Ozzy Stewart had done. We made either one or two-stage lesions of the entorhinal area, 
and we injected tritiated proline into the surviving intact contralateral and toronal area. And then we did a track tracing study exploring the sprouting response of the cross pathway in the dorsal molecular layer as well as the ventral molecular layer of the dent HRS in the contralateral hemisphere. Here we are looking at grain density plotted against days post lesion, and we're looking at the dorsal leaf. What I'd like to point out right from the outset is that animals that sustained a progressive lesion showed an elevated density as early as four days post lesion that was maintained from six to eight days post lesion. The other group I want to point out is the one stage group. These animals sustained a one stage lesion of the entomolic cortex. And then we did a track tracing study of the cross pathway there. And you note that at four days and six days post lesion, it's not significantly different from either the control of the primate groups. But by eight days post lesion, it has now increased in density. The cross pathway in a one stage animal or group actually had increased dramatically by eight days post lesion, overlapping with what we saw with the progressive lesion group. The important feature of this set of data here is notice that the priming lesion group is no different from the control, the intact control animals. When we look to the ventral leaf, we find the same pattern of results, which is as early as four days post lesion, it's maintained through six and eight days post lesion, the progressive lesion group shows an increased density that is maintained from four to eight days post lesion. And the one stage group, animals got a one stage lesion, followed at four, six, and eight days post lesion. You'll know that by eight days post lesion, it had increased in its density as well. Now, what's so interesting here about the one stage lesion, I should say, is that the one stage evidence that we've accumulated in this particular study corroborates what other colleagues have done. So the one stage effect that we're looking at, other colleagues have also seen. What's new and novel to us, of course, is that we've demonstrated here that there is enhanced or accelerated sprouting of the cross pathway after this progressive lesion. And once again, the priming lesion is no different from the control group. Let's take a look at some dark field autoradiograms. Uh, figure A here is an intact rat, and we are looking at the density of innervation um, in the outer molecular layer in an intact rat. And as you can see by these little so, well, white spots, that it's not particularly dense. We look to an animal with a priming lesion. This is an animal that um, received a priming lesion. Six days later, it got a sham operation. Six days later, the animal was euthanized and we studied the cross pathway. And what you find is that after priming lesion alone, there is not a significant difference in the density of innervation of the molecular layer, quite similar to what you see in an intact animal. Figure C here is an animal that sustained a one stage lesion of the entomolar cortex. Six days later, the animal was euthanized. We study the cross pathway, and you'll also note that the density level is not all that dissimilar to what we see in figures A and B. Figure D is an animal that sustained a progressive lesion. This animal sustained a two-stage lesion of the entorhinal area. Six days after the secondary lesion, you process the material, and what you see is a dramatic increase in the density found in the denervated, renervated zone of the molecular layer at six days post-lesion. So what do we make of this? Progressive lesions of the entorhinal area do indeed accelerate the rate of cross tempodentate sprouting. So now we'll talk about the neurophysiological studies. We undertook the neurophysiological studies because we needed to have a bridge, a bridge between the structural changes that we were looking for, which is what we just talked about, and then to the outcome of behavior that is the final set of experiments we're going to talk about. We needed a bridge to anatomical with the behavioral. So we wanted to ask whether or not synaptic e efficacy itself might be altered as a consequence of these progressive lesions. So we asked, do these CTD synaptic changes that we're looking at, are they functionally significant as demonstrated looking at synaptic efficacy? What we did was to make either one or two stage lesions of the entorhinal area. And we inserted a stimulating electrode into the angular bundle of the intact entorhinal cortex in the contralateral hemisphere. And we inserted our recording electrodes, and this is all field EPSPs that we're looking for. These are extracellular recordings in the dent HRs of the contralateral hemisphere. Here we are plotting amplitude against days post lesion. And here we're looking at the field EPSPs. 
From the outset, I'd like to point out that the animals that sustained the progressive lesion showed an enhanced amplitude as early as four days post-lesion that was maintained and in fact was a continuing increase till eight days post-lesion in this particular experiment. And neither the priming lesion nor the one-stage lesion actually enhanced synaptic efficacy in these animals of this experiment between four and eight days post-lesion. They were not significantly different from the control cases. This next slide, we're looking at the slope of these field EPSPs, and we're plotting rate of rise of slope against days post-lesion. And just like in the last slide, the progressive lesion group showed an elevated set of responses, synaptic efficacy as demonstrated by slope, as early as four days post-lesion that was maintained through eight days post-lesion. And once again, there were no significant differences among the remainder of the groups, control, priming, or the one-stage animals in this particular experiment. I want to show you some of the wave tracings from this experiment. In an intact rat, the cross temporal density projection will uh, generate a volt of about a half a millivolt to a millivolt response in a control animal. And we see that nice illustrated here. And that corroborates what all the colleagues have found as well. The lower wave tracing is an animal that sustained a priming lesion, waited the appropriate six day interlesion interval, and recorded six days after that interval was over. And you'll note that the wave tracing is not all that different from what we see in an intact rat, a little over half millivolt. The upper wave tracing is an animal that sustained a one-stage lesion of the uh, enorhinal cortex. And this is six days after the lesion. And what you see is a slight elevation in the response of the cross pathway on the order of 1.3 millivolts in this particular case. The lower wave tracing is an animal that sustained a progressive lesion, two stage lesion of the inner anal cortex unilaterally. Six days after the second lesion, we recorded from the animal's brain. What we find is a dramatic tripling of the response, dramatic increase in the response. And one feature that was particularly interesting to see is that we also find evidence of a pop spike. One of the features of the cross pathway at 60 and 90 days post lesion is that that cross pathway is capable of eliciting a granule cell discharge, but it typically is months after the lesion. And what we're finding evidence here in this particular case, as early as six days after the secondary lesion, we have evidence of a pop spike. What do we conclude? Progressive lesions of the entral area do indeed increase synaptic drive of that cross pathway. So this part of the bridge then between the anatomical and behavioral seems to be consistent with what we found in the anatomical study. I'm a psychologist. I'm very interested in behavioral output. What does this mean for behaving organisms? Well, we wanted to determine then whether recovery of spatial memory is accelerated after progressive two-stage lesions of the enterinal area. And we use this particular maze apparatus to test spatial memory. For those of you who may not have looked at behavior recently, this is called a Y maze. And I bet you can guess why we call it a Y maze. So the animals are trained to run left and right, left and right for food reward. It's a retention task. So the animals first have to reach a rigorous level of, of ability. And our uh, criteria involve uh, three days consecutive of no more than two errors per day. So here we're plotting errors against days post lesion after one stage or two stage lesions of the entral area. First three days illustrate that these animals have all command of the task. They are now performing at a high level. Then they receive either a sham operation or the priming lesion. The sham operation was given to the one stage animals and the sham operates. The priming lesion was given to the progressive lesion group. And then they were tested during the inner lesion interval. And what we have evidence here for is that during this ILI, the animals were not significantly different from one another when, statistically speaking, when the animals were tested during this ILI. At the end of that period, the six-day window, 
We make the secondary operation in the progressive lesion. We make a one-stage lesion in the one-stage group and a sham operation in the sham operates. What I'd like to point out is what happened to the one-stage group. The one-stage animals showed a deficiency in spatial memory that lasted eight to 12 days post-lesion. Remember, one of the things that we were talking about is you look for parallel in the time course and the neuroanatomical phenomena. Other laboratories have demonstrated this, that about eight to 12 days post-lesion, there is this recovery. Now that corresponds to the time at which the subtodente pathway, the cross pathway, and the intrinsic uh, pathways of commissural and association fiber plexus are all sprouting and becoming activated. And this corroborates what others have found. What's interesting to us in particular is the progressive lesion group. Remember, these animals sustained a two-stage lesion of the internal cortex, and then they were retested. And what we find is that these animals showed no behavioral impairment on this particular task in comparison to the sham operates. In fact, one of the interesting features is that they recover more rapidly than the sham operates. In the next manipulation of the experiment, we're here plotting errors against days post lesion. We did a transection of the dorsal saltarium. This is a technique that Ozzie Stewart had used in other studies as well, as well as Steve Sheff. We transected the dorsal saltarium because that's the pathway through which the cross temporodente pathway travels. So, as we see in this slide, the animals had again command of the alternation task. And then we make this transection. Now, the transaction is quite long. It's from uh, Bregma back to Lambda. So the animals that were sham operates before now actually get the transection of the cross pathway. And it's pretty long. And what you see, there's a slight deficiency, but then the animals are alternating at normal levels again. The one-stage animals, remember, these animals had sustained a one-stage lesion, has shown a behavioral deficiency, recovered eight to 12 days. Now we transect the cross pathway and we reinstate the behavioral impairment. So now the animals are again showing a deficiency and that deficiency is persistent and lasts for three weeks post lesion. The progressive lesion group is an interesting group. If you recall, the progressive lesion group got the two stage lesions of the internal area, did not show behavioral impairment relative to the sham operates. Now we transect the cross pathway and what we find is an instatement of a behavioral deficit. That is every bit as profound as that what you see in the one stage group, and it's as persistent. So how do we make sense of this? Well, a surgical manipulation that accelerated CTD sprouting also accelerated recovery of spatial memory. We argue that based on our anatomical, neurophysiological, and behavioral data, we propose that enhancing sprouting by neurons that survive an injury that are similar to those that were injured, homotypic sprouting, that this sprouting actually may compensate for the loss of cells occurring after brain injury. Do our findings have any bearing on the vicariation hypothesis? To remind you of the vicariation hypothesis, one could mention that we should be thinking about tissue surrounding some damaged region takes over the function of the damaged area. Our findings at least align with the first possibility. The function may be removed to similar tissue in the contralateral portion of the brain. Do our findings have any clinical relevance? Hippocampal sprouting of the sort that we've been chatting about occurs in the victims of Alzheimer's disease. In the mid-1980s, Carl Kottman demonstrated and his group demonstrated that there is in fact subtodentate sprouting in an Alzheimer's brain. And we think it's as a consequence of the enteronal injury that occurs in Alzheimer's disease, which is one of the first areas that's targeted by the disease process, unfortunately. Now it's conceivable that axonal sprouting of the sort that we've talked about here may occur also in victims of other progressive CNS diseases, stroke, traumatic brain injury. There are three possible outcomes that one can conceive of after sprouting responses. One is it might be adaptive. It could be that this kind of reorganization actually promotes recovery function. Two, which is very concerning, is that it also can be maladaptive. It could be that when we see the reorganization of a system that is actually introducing more noise into the system and actually retarding, uh, retarding other compensatory processes potentially. Third is that it's epiphenomenal. Doesn't mean much to a behaving organism. Truth be told, the behavioral consequences of CNS sprouting in human beings at this point 
is not really understood. But our findings raise the interesting possibility that CNS sprouting in an adult mammalian brain may be functionally significant, and under some instances in which there's homotypic sprouting, might actually be adaptive, promoting recovery of function. The quote that I shared with you a little bit earlier is often, often used in neuroplasticity literature. And what you don't see typically is what Ramon Cajal had to say after he made that assertion. This is what he had to say in the next sentence. It is for the science of the future to change, if possible, this harsh decree. Inspired with high ideals, it must work to impede or moderate the gradual decay of the neurons to overcome the almost invincible rigidity of their connections and to reestablish normal nerve paths when disease has severed centers that were intimately associated. I would think that Ramon Cajal would be delighted to know that over the last 50 years, we proved him to be wrong. The work that I shared with you today was supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. And all the work that I talked about today was done with my undergraduates at Davidson College. And these are the young people um, who contributed to these efforts over the years. They've all gone on to do great things on their own now. So that's the experimental side of the talk. At, at, because uh, Gina and Jerry asked me to talk about my own path. If you bear with me, I'm going to spend a little time talking about how I got to this platform to talk about our work, to celebrate Joe and Jim's life's work. So I'm going to talk about my path, and it is with heartfelt gratitude to my mother, Elia Rosa Cortez. My mom immigrated to the United States from Cuba in 1941. She was 20 years old and she moved in with our, her sister. And she began a lifelong job sequence of working in factories. She was an assembly line worker. And what you see in the lower left-hand portion here is a picture of my mom, in fact. We think that might be from Dictaphone Corporation. She worked in a variety of, of factories throughout her life. She retired in 69. My mom had unconditional love for me and my sister. She was fearless in protecting us. And you'll see the neighborhood that I grew, in, grew up in probably needed a little protection. She had absolute unwavering belief that we could do whatever we wanted to do in this new adopted nation of ours. Everything that I have accomplished Everything that I will accomplish, everything that my children accomplish is a consequence of my mother. Along the way, I have been extraordinarily fortunate. Hillary Clinton wrote a great book, Takes a Village, right? Takes a Village. In my particular instance, it took a small city of mentors. And I have been so fortunate to have an amazing set of mentors over the years. Uh, Don Stein is pictured here in this photo. I don't know, see my little, that's Donald right there. And we're flanked by two of my, my closest friends in neuroscience in those early days. Ozzie Stewart has mentored me. Michael Zygmunt, who now lives in Woods Hole, was one of my mentors. I did my work at MIT with Jerry Schneider and Sonal Javari. They were wonderful mentors during that period. I spent time with Pat Goldman Rakich at Yale. She was an amazing woman. Bill Greeno, an extraordinary mentor as well. I called him my, ment my mentor at a distance. We saw each other at, annually at SFN meetings and we would talk. And invariably he gave me great advice. And then I had a whole group of mentors through college. Ron Salafia, Jack Botano, Garcia Braginski and Betsy Gardner. And I would not have gotten to where I am without the help of all these people to get me to where I am currently. So my path, I'm gonna go back further in time, bear with me. Several of you in the audience are thinking at this point, oh my God, he's talking about Christmas when he was an infant. Yes, that is an 
a Christmas picture. And that is me in the middle. I was, in fact, an infant there. Indeed. That beautiful woman to the right side there, that's my mom. That kind of pain in the butt there in the lower left-hand corner is my beautiful sister, Ellie. I'm the one in the middle. And I was raised a Catholic, so we did celebrate that particular holiday. So it looks idyllic, doesn't it? Everybody's sitting in front of this Christmas tree. It's wonderful. I'm only assuming that my father took this picture. About two weeks after this picture was taken, my father abandoned my family. He disappeared. Left my mom her own devices to raise me and my sister. As a consequence, my mom moved herself and my sister, Ellie, to a nearby city, Stratford, Connecticut. And she moved to Stratford because she was working at one of the factories there. And it was easier for her to get back. We didn't have a car. So it was easier for her to get back and forth. And she asked my abuelita, my abuela, my grandmother to take care of me. So the time is a little hard to recall. I was an infant. Somewhere about one to two years of time passed in this particular scenario. And my mom would come to see me on weekends with my sister, apparently. I don't remember. My abuelita had me till at least 1959, 1960, and she returned to Cuba around that period of time. That snapshot gives you an idea of winter where we were, and it was called the village. The village was a nice, pleasant term uh, for projects. So what I grew up in were the projects of Bridgeport, Connecticut. One set of them. I can name a whole bunch of them for you. But this has been the one that I grew up in, the village. So this is now the early 1960s, probably 1960, I'm guessing. You know, the, the photos didn't have digitized numbers on them. And the reason I'm showing you this particular picture, besides the fact that I'm wearing such wonderful clothing, once again, if you see the two little scarves I'm wearing, clearly my mother loved that scarf and she wanted me to wear that scarf. So sometime in this early picture, I took this pic, she took this picture of me. The shadow there you see is my mom. But the reason I'm showing you this picture is because of the station wagon that is sitting behind me. I don't know if you can read it from where you are, but it says, Crippled Children's Workshop. Crippled Children's Workshop. When I was two and a half under my grandmother's care, I was infected with poliomyelitis. My left leg was paralyzed, and I only have glimpses of memories of being in braces during my early, early years, just glimpses. And the Crippled Children's Workshop was a place that I would get physical therapy. And I do have memories of actually going there. And the driver, in fact, I remember him, his name, Mr. Munson. And he would drive me from the village out to uh, what would ultimately become an Easter Seals facility um, on a weekly basis, I guess. And I would have physical therapy during those years. Until I was 12, I was in and out of hospitals because my left and right legs were growing at differential rates. My left was, was, was had serious paresis, extremely weak. And um, doctor, uh, an orthopedic surgeon, um, Dr. Strayer was my doctor and he rebuilt my legs, hips down. I, I was like the bionic man, crazy. This is during the early days of this kind of orthopedic surgery. And I was extremely fortunate that we were able to do it while we were on welfare. I wanted to show you another view of the village. So this gives you an idea of the village and what it looked like. So these are the buildings that we lived in. And you'll notice another snowy landscape, but clearly my mom loved to take pictures during snowy landscapes, very different from Cuba, I would imagine. And um, as a kid, it always struck me kind of unusual. See, the village actually had a formal name. The formal name of the village was Evergreen Garden Apartments. Evergreen Garden Apartments. As a kid, I knew two things about the village. Number one, it was never green. 
And number two, there wasn't a garden to be found. A lot of dirt, and that's about it. So I went to a um, elementary school in town, well, in town, like just a few blocks away from the village where I lived. And I used to walk to um, St. Stephen's School, it was a Catholic school. And I went to this school, it was Hungarian nuns were teaching. And by 1966, five, there had been a change in that area of Bridgeport, Connecticut. There were Hungarian nuns. They were Hungarian because once upon a time, there were a lot of Hungarian peoples in that region. My eighth grade class of some 20, somewhere in the order of 14 Latinos, five African-Americans, and one white kid. I remember learning Hungarian songs. I couldn't speak English and I'm learning Hungarian songs, but it was a great place to learn how to read, how to write and how to do arithmetic. I learned that. I then went on to Colby High School. Colby was on Kasuth Street in a tough area of town. That one was um, run by Polish priests, it was Franciscan. And it was the UN of Bridgeport. Every nationality, every race, every ethnicity was at that school and I loved it. My kids call it Happy High, a great experience. <laughs> then I had to make a decision about either go to college or go to work at a factory. My mom was kind of cool on the idea of going to college. She knew about college. She did not attend college, she did not graduate from high school. She was thinking that college could sound like a cool thing or I could go work at one of the factories in Bridgeport, my call. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna to go to college. Sounds kind of good. I didn't know anything about college either, but I figured I'd learn from my guidance counselor who didn't give a whole lot of counseling. And there were three schools that I decided to apply to. I applied to Fairfield University in Fairfield, Connecticut, Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, and the University of Connecticut at Storrs. I chose to go to the school that gave me the most money. I had never set foot on campus of any of these schools. I didn't know what they looked like aside from whatever I got. In the old days, we used to get little pamphlets in the mail, right? That's all I knew of them, my little pamphlet in the mail. But I applied to all three, I got in, but it was Fairfield U that gave me the most money. I was actually on a full ride putting scholarships together. And it turns out that I was also recipient of the BEOG in its first year. BEOG is a basic educational opportunity grant. You would know it as the Pell Grant. So I was one of the first recipients of the BEOG in my freshman year of college. It enabled me to go to college. I chose school at Fairfield University. My first day on campus at Fairfield U was my first day on campus at Fairfield U and college itself. And I looked around. And there's a new sign of Fairfield U there, kind of a cool sign. On the right side is near the pond. That looked like then as it does now. I just left Bridgeport nine miles door to door to get from where I lived at my mom's house. I was a commuter to Fairfield U. I arrived on campus, pulled in North Benson Road, got into the gates, looked around and said, oh my God, how do we get a job here, right? So I asked her, okay, so what do you got to do to get a job at a place like this? And I said, well, you got to get a PhD. I said, I'm going to get a PhD. I don't know what the hell that PhD is going to be in, but I'm going to get one. So fast forward a little bit. It turns out I discovered psychology and the neuroscience. I'm, ooh, this is really great. And I moved forward and I started studying with uh, Ron Salafia in his laboratory. And we published our first paper in 1979 with my friend, Nick Hiaia. Ron took me under his wing and during the academic year, I worked with him in the laboratory. That taught me a little bit about how to get students engaged in a lab setting, even in college. But during the summers, I did not have the capacity, the wherewithal to just go work in a laboratory and volunteer. That wasn't happening. So what I used to do during the summers while I was in college was I was a member as a counselor in college of efforts in anti-poverty programs, anti-poverty programs. 
I was a kid in the anti-poverty program. I can tell you, CETA, Comprehensive Employment Training Act, ABCD, Action on Bridgeport Community Development. I was a kid in these programs as a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old. And then when I got to college, I then moved up into the counselor range. My favorite time was when I got to do the YTY program. YTY stands for Youth Tutoring Youth. I did this for my last two years of college. This is where I learned that mentorship matters. It was my job to mentor these high schoolers. This is Bassett High School. To mentor these high schoolers while they were tutoring elementary school kids. My job was to help them learn to read and write as well. And I did that for two summers in the Santa Poverty Program. And these are amazing young people that I had an opportunity to work with during that time of my life. During the academic year, I still had to earn money. So in order to finally get to graduate, which I did in 1977, that's my mom, a few times that she'd been on campus, I worked 20 hours a week through college. And I had a wide range of jobs. I was a school bus driver from, from Monroe. And I don't know how the heck I did it, but I was up in, in Adam at 5.30 a.m., getting to the kids to school, and then started my own classes. And then at the end of the day, I would go get back to my bus route and take them back home. I had jobs working as a customer correspondent, which is really, it was really, a, I was a dunner. What I would do is I'd call businesses that owe Dictaphone money and say, give us some money. That was a fun job. I worked for Carpenter Steel Corporation. Every day I walked into Carpenter Steel, I would walk into the steel mill and I would see these men and women working really hard in fumes and molten steel. My job was to clean toilets and to scrub the shower room so walls. So I cleaned over the past of that semester, thousands of toilets and hundreds of shower room walls. And everyone I worked with in that period of my life, whether it was that job or any other, all of these individuals were people of high integrity. They were doing noble work, important work, and I was privileged to spend time with them. Although I had a different objective for my career. You know, part of the story that Johan had went ahead and told him a little about, you know, where I got a PhD, did a postdoc, et cetera, et cetera. Every now and then, you encounter a surreal moment. And my surreal moment was when I met President Barack Obama. We had been prepped to meet the president, but didn't know for sure that we would actually meet President Obama. We were there for a week. And they had a, a plan for us. Uh, the NSF runs the program, although it's a White House award. The plan was, if the president has time to see you, you will walk in according to your height, he will walk in, take a picture, and you're out of there in 30 seconds. I said, okay, we got this, we got this. There are 15 of us, I think we could do this. Well, turns out President Obama had different plans. He went ahead and greeted us at the door, and just had us enter one by one. And he had set up his own photographer to take a picture of each of us as we were shaking his hand. And Barack Obama, don't ask me how, he knew enough about 15 of us to ask each of us about the work that we do with specific questions about what we do. The person in front of me was doing robotics. He asked about robotics. They got to me, he was asking about brain plasticity. It knocked my socks off. We entered, lined up against uh, the desk, the Resolute, ready to take the picture. He says, you know, I don't wanna do this. Let's talk. We wound up spending half an hour with the president. Deeply moving moment. And he's a funny guy. He had a great sense of humor. And these pictures that you see us, uh, I don't know whether you can see us laughing in there, but we're laughing and guffawing would be a good word. Terrifically entertaining, funny, and brilliant. It was an amazing moment. In my own life, 
my work here at Davidson. One of the greatest pleasures in my life is mentoring. And the upper left-hand corner are my students that I spent the summer with in my lab. The right-hand corner here, upper right-hand corner, is one of my students, James Sanchez, who graduated a number of years ago. We tried to do outreach this past year. Was, that wasn't going to happen. But we see some K-1ers who came to school. Lower left-hand corner, Mercedes Robinson, working with some of the Cubs that came through, Cub Scouts that came through. I'm working with Matt Deere in the lower right. I have been so deeply privileged to have an opportunity to contribute to the NSP at the Society for Neuroscience. We got the Paceman Award in 2014. This is a group that uh, came out of the 2014 cohort. And I'd like to point out this amazing scientist in the lower right-hand corner now, I find that Dr. Poe is kind of interesting, right? Because you all know she's world renowned for, for sleep research, right? I'm absolutely convinced that Dr. Poe studies sleep because she doesn't sleep herself. As you all know, she's co-director of Spines. She's co-director of NSP. She's director of every program that exists at UCLA, teaching and a wild laboratory, incredibly successful. And I have personally been so privileged to have the last nine years working with Dr. Poe uh, on the NSP. And it's just been a lot of fun along the way. And Jerry, I know that you have a lot of fun as well as a consequence. So I wanna share some life lessons with you. Just some points that you may keep in mind as you're going on your own path. First, have faith in yourself. I'm imagining that many of you listening to this story today have encountered your own obstacles, have encountered your own hurdles, have encountered your own barriers. It could happen daily. Maybe it's occasional. First thing to recall is that the fact that you're here today, I'm speaking to the young people, the fact that you're here today is incontrovertible evidence that you are successful. You have succeeded to be here in this moment. You are worthy of the success. You will hear every now and then, bubbling up from some recess in your brain, a doubt. self-doubt. You will experience a moment of imposter syndrome. And you will ask yourself, why, how am I here when I'm surrounded by so many smart people? My mom, under those conditions, had a word that some of you may be familiar with. I want to share it with you. It's an exhortation. So, Leviah, away. Leave me these thoughts. They're not real. Thoughts are thoughts. You make them real or not. And that is one that self-doubt you can send off. You are successful. You have been successful. You will continue to be successful. It is your future. You belong. You belong here as a member of the Spines family. You belong in neuroscience as a member of the neuroscientific family. You belong in science as a member of the scientific community. You belong. Take risks as a member of this community. Be bold as a member of this community. You will make great 
discoveries in your path, in your journey. But those great discoveries rely on you and your willingness to take a risk and to be bold in your journey. There are safe questions you can ask. There are other questions that turn things around as we try to think about how we make sense of this brain function, structure, world around us. Take the risk. One of the features I have noticed over the years when I listen to Nobel laureates talk is a common theme among these Nobel laureate visits. The theme is failure. Don't be afraid to fail. One after the other. Don't be afraid to fail. You are going to fail. We all fail. I'm, I'm sure all of us have experienced the experiment that didn't work. It happens to me all the time. But you got to get up, brush yourself off, and keep moving forward and be bold in the process. And sometimes when you're feeling bruised by that failure, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to turn to your mentors, your colleagues, your family, your friends for support. Family and friends may not understand. My mother didn't understand a thing I did as a scientist. She couldn't. Could she give me support? Absolutely. They know what it feels like to be in your shoes as a member of a family or because they're close friends and that empathy is there. Rely on it. There's no shame in it. There's no harm in it. It's okay to look to your group of friends, family, colleagues in the sciences, colleagues in neuroscience, spines, colleagues for that support. A lot of times when we do our work, we get caught up in the drudgery. When I did my postdoc at MIT, I sliced brain upon brain upon brain. It was really drudgery. But we need to remind ourselves about the joy of this discovery path that we're on. Every now and then, it's not so bad. It's just step back and remind yourself of the reason that you're in science to begin with. And there are those pinnacle moments when you make the discovery and you experience that explosion of joy in that discovery. But every now and then, until you get to those, go, well, those don't happen on a daily basis. At least it never did to me anyway. There are moments you can step back and enjoy that moment of joy in what it is that you're doing, the act of doing research. And finally, pay it forward. Joe Martinez and Jim Townsell have a legacy. They have created the path that you all as young people here are now enjoying as it came to fruition because of their investment in what they saw as the future. They took a risk. They were bold to create this path that you as spine students are getting to enjoy. The now Jerry and Gina are continuing forward. But you must pay it forward. It is almost a moral obligation, if not an outright moral obligation, that you prepare the path for those who follow you. You will make great discoveries. You will make great contributions to neuroscience. But the world being what it is, there will be continue to be obstacles, there will be continuing to be biases, hurdles that others will have to deal with. And you can prepare the path for them, for the next generation that follows you. You have the intellect, you have the work ethic, have the belief in yourself, and you can make this all happen and make the next generation and live in a more socially just world and one in which 
differences among all of the peoples that live on this planet can be minimized. You can do this in your hands. Unfortunately, on July 2nd, one of my heroes in the village, Dr. Juan Lopez passed away after combating with cancer over the last several months. Juan inspired all of us who knew him with his laughter, his loving nature, and his dedication to educating, to educating children in underserved communities in the state of Connecticut. He was the superintendent of vocational schools in the state of Connecticut. He influenced thousands of kids, large number of whom came from underserved communities. And he ensured that these kids had a great education, these old tech schools. And he was like a big brother to me while I was growing up in the village. Look at that, adios, thank you. Have time for questions? Uh, just come to the microphone. So much for the fascinating talk. I was curious: um, Does the timing of the second interrenal lesion affect the enhanced effects of the, uh, the uh, progressive lesion? Well, on that's a great question. In fact, it's called the catalytic effect. And yes, the timing is really important. So, uh, depending upon that window. Uh, you can either accelerate the way that we described it here, but if it's too short a window or too long a window, it turns out that that catalytic effect is not effective. It, it doesn't happen. So there is kind of a magical window, and there's lots of reasons that I could spec uh, speculate as to why that might be the case, that it has to, uh, that second layer lesion has to occur in. And I was curious, what are some of the ideas for the signals that are released that promote sprouting NGF and new signals? Well, I'm, I'm didn't quite get your question. Where were the, what are some of the thoughts on the, the signals oh, released from the lesion? Yeah, down? great, great question. So there's evidence to suggest that the degenerating terminals that are occurring as a consequence of the enterrhinal lesion, that the degenerating terminals are part of the signal pathway. We know that there is a uh, cascading glial effect. So within 24 hours of the deaffrontation, uh, microglia get activated. Within a couple of days of that, uh, reactive astrocytes start appearing in the denervated zone of the molecular layer. And uh, the microglial cells actually are evident for quite some time. And the detritus that is left after the uh, enterrhinal lesion, that is slowly uh, eliminated. Um, Ozzy Stewart did some work uh, with a mouse model in which there was a, a delay in Wallerian degeneration. And uh, that delay corresponded to when sprouting would wind up occurring, which is why we think that there's a possibility that the degeneration is a signal event as to what might be going on. Thank you, that's a great question. Uh, yes, I was wondering if that second lesion, which accelerates sprouting, and sprouting that's functional, which is amazing. Um, that lends a lot of hope to people who've had um, brain injuries and strokes. Should there be um, a type of treatment that would be like acupuncture for the brain that would help accelerate a functional sprouting? Right. <laughs> well, there actually can be surgical interventions, for example, as opposed to going in. And uh, let's say that you're going after a tumor. As opposed to going in in one fell swoop and removing the tumor, then you're damaging tissue on the way through. One possibility one could imagine is you do it in smaller steps over a period of longer period of time. And that may wind up uh, diminishing some of the more dramatic experiences by, of, of removing cortex in one fell swoop, let's say it's cortex. That, the reason that this particular set of experiments were done 
and that Steve Sheff started the work many years ago uh, is because he was trying to answer a question having to do with the serial lesion phenomenon. We do know, this is based on some very early work from the 1960s and early 70s, that if you make two-stage lesions of the cortical regions, subcortical regions, but the two stage are one hemisphere, then the other, that seems to reduce deficits associated with that removal of tissue. What this particular set of experiments allows us to do is to look at the specific mechanisms by which that acceleration of, of recovery or sparing of recovery actually, and that's what we're seeing, uh, might occur. Uh, so that is a lesson that can be used in surgical interventions. Of course, our hope is that we can also look at other signal events. Uh, that last question was a terrific one. As we are trying to potentially pharmacologically manipulate the system, accelerating sprouting. So in our laboratory, for example, we've explored uh, nerve growth factor uh, using an adeno-associated virus uh, vector to drive the construction of nerve growth factor in this model preparation. And also BFGF, which is an, another protein that we know uh, can influence sprouting responses in the system. Um, and we've done an experiment with cesticle sign on that one. And we've actually been able to demonstrate uh, an enhancement of sprouting by the uh, cholinergic substituente pathway with both FGF, BFGF, as well as NGF. Um, so those possibilities exist. So we hope that pharmacologically we can try to do this in some way. Thank you. So in your progressive um, protocol where you make a couple of lesions, how far can you push that? Could you do like three, four, like, is there a limit or do you kind of max out on the effect when you just make? A uh, again, a really a great question. So you can, you can certainly try in smaller steps. Um, and, and because of these animals being what they are, that small priming lesion, which is in our experiments, it's the lateral entorhinal cortex. We could start using them in, in separate, like a, add a third component to it. Uh, but the question that we're hoping to answer is just, will the catalytic effect occur with the two? And we've answered that question, but there's absolutely no reason to suspect that, if, you know, that we might not alter perhaps accelerate even more rapidly, more incremental damage. When we are talking about tumor growth, and that's what I think of when you raised this and uh, Dr. Cole a few minutes ago, tumor growth probably parallels more like the sorts of things that you're talking about. Right? It's really incremental. A glioblastoma may take you know, months to go on. And every time it grows and encroaches on more cortical material, let's say, that's like you know, one small, another priming lesion. And so when we look at the outcome in tumor situations, for example, and when there's finally some precipitating event where a deficiency appears, whether it's cognitive or affective, depending upon where the tumor is located, perhaps that slow growing tumor actually did not present because of that very slow incremental nature of growth, really kind of like what you were describing, uh, Dr. Downs. So certainly possible. Are there any other questions? There are no other questions. Thank, let's thank Dr. Ramirez. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you all at Guoping Fang's Friday evening lecture tomorrow. Thank you again, Dr. Ramirez. I want to encourage everyone who's attending.